Last night, we watched the first episode of the Mrs. and Mrs. Smith. Mrs. and Mrs.? Mr. and Mrs. Smith <laughs> TV show uh, that Amazon is making starring uh, Donald Glover and Maya Erskine. That obviously is based on a 2000s movie uh, starring Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Mm-hmm. Written by Simon Kinberg, I think. And then oh, this is now you, so. a remake in a TV show form of that uh, original movie. What do you think about that idea of remaking a movie, recreating it, and uh, putting it into television? I think it's happening a lot. <laughs> Percy Jackson also, just the thing. Obviously, it was a book, but they made that into a movie first and then changed it into a TV show. I think in the case of Mr. and Mrs. Smith, where it's not based off a book, uh, so then it's just its own like creation, I think. It's not a third level of IP. It's a second level yeah, of IP. Yeah, exactly. Via, via I, think it, I think it works really well because it's not, it's not trying to be a shot for shot. Like, let's just dive deeper into what this movie was in the moment of that movie and trying to recreate those characters exactly. It's more so giving that background and context to how that couple could have gotten to where they're at in that in the movie Mm -hmm. um so i think it's a lot more interesting because it's giving whether you're a fan of that movie or just general audience more background into how individuals could end up in this couple yeah it's interesting because it's really not even like an adapt like it's not the retelling of Mm -mm. the the brad pitt Angelina Mo- uh, Jolie movie. It is really just like taking the name Mrs. and Mrs. Smith and the Mr. idea and that Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Smith. <laughs> Listen, I'm inclusive. I, we, <laughs> uh, we love couples of all relationships. The thing is, the, the interesting there. thing with this show is it feels like this is just one version of mm. several different Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Couples. Mr. Yeah, and yeah, Mr. Yeah. Smith. You know, like it feels like this company that they work for just pairs people together and whatever works, works. So they easily could down the road in a new season where this fits a different couple now. It could be Mrs. and Mrs. Smith. You know, it, this feels like it opens the door open. Opens the door open. Um, <laughs> Keeps the door open. For it to just continuously build upon this espionage world. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's taking a concept and expanding upon it. And that's the beauty of, of television is where you have, you know, more space to work. The movie that we are talking about today, mm-hmm. they obviously have done something similar. They've made it into a bit of a TV show, a bit of an anthology TV show. Mm-hmm. So let's go ahead and get into things. This is MK300. I'm Corbin. And I'm Mina. And we're tackling our watch list of 300 specially curated movies one at a time and talking about them. Today we are talking about the 1996 black comedy film, Fargo. Once upon a time. Looks like she's gonna turn cold tomorrow. Yeah, you got that right. There was a salesman called Jerry Lundergaard. Okay, real good then. Who always dreamt of striking it rich. Wait, have you had a chance to think about that deal I was talking about, those 40 acres there in Wyzetta? Jerry, we're not going to just give you $750,000. No, no, but see, I... <laughs> so, we all set on this thing, then? You want your own wife kidnapped. <laughs> now, her dad, he's real well off, so why don't you just ask him for the money? <laughs> <laughs> Son? Wade, it's Jerry. I don't know what to do. It's something hard, geez. It's terrible. But in a place called Fargo... Mr. Lundegaard, I'm a police officer. I'm not Brainerd, investigating some malfeasance. Anything can happen. How's Jean? Who's Jean? Ah! My wife. Oops! <laughs> With all due respect, Jerry, I don't want you mucking this up. The heck do you mean? No Jean, no money! Who are you? Circumstance that changed, Jerry. What the heck do you mean? Blood has been shed, Jerry. Here's the second one. I want you to tell me what these fellas look like. Well, the little guy, he was kind of funny looking. Can you be any more specific? He wasn't circumcised. Jeez, that's a good lead. Yeah. From the creators of Barton Fink. I'm cooperating here. And there, uh, there's no... Uh... And Raising Arizona. What do you fellas got yourself mixed up in? Oh, jeez. You're there in 30 minutes where I find you, Jerry, and I shoot you, and I shoot your wife, and I shoot all your little children, and I shoot them all in the back of the little heads. You got it? <laughs> you should shoot the other guy. Oh, jeez. 
Fargo. Directed officially by Joel Cohen and an uncredited co-direction from his brother, Ethan Cohen. Fargo stars Frances McDormand as Marge Gunderson, a pregnant Minnesota police chief investigating a triple homicide that takes place after a desperate car salesman, played by William H. Macy, hires two criminals, played by Steve Buscemi and Peter Stormare, to kidnap his wife in order to extort a hefty ransom from his wealthy father-in-law, played by Harvey Presnell. Fargo is pure 90s Midwest comedy at its finest. I said Marge, but I should have said Marge, uh, because the accents are prevalent in this movie. It's on the list because it's on your watch list, Mina. Why is that? Oh, I don't remember why I added this to the watch list. Uh, Other than there had been several times in my adolescence where there was this mom of a girl I played basketball with that would wear a Fargo t-shirt to Mm. things and talk about the uh, wood chipper scene, which Mm. was weird because I had never seen the movie. And I was like, why are we talking about this at basketball? Bit of a spoiler there. (laughs) Yeah, a little bit. Um, And then also This is 40 Mm. makes a reference to it uh, in a very funny scene where spouses talk about killing each other. Uh, and so I think this movie, I've been wanting to watch it for a long time. So that'd be fun to watch with you. Yeah, I think uh, I had seen this movie once or twice before this rewatch with you for our MK300 list. Um, and it's one that I enjoy. I'm a big fan of the the Coen brothers. We've watched a couple of their movies together. I think we both enjoy Which them. Ones? Notably like Raising Arizona that we saw in theaters together. Um, that is a good one. But I mean, other movies like uh, No Country for Old Men, which will appear on this list that we will get to Have watch together. Seen. Stuff like uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Tragedy of Macbeth. The Burn classics. After Reading. Yeah, I mean, the, the list goes on, but... They're good. I like them. This is, uh, I think, you know, probably their most iconic film it's the movie that you know has the most prominent francis mcdormand performance i think in their entire catalog i love her um and obviously she is the uh, the wife of ethan cohen in real life nope she is the wife of joel cohen in real life <laughs> wow um ethan cohen is is married to uh trisha cook they have a an interesting marriage that we don't need to get in here but if you just want to google uh that situation i'll look it up after this because that uh, sounds fun to go down but, but reg- regardless this is their you know i think this is their most iconic movie i think it hits home uh well for both of us because it is so midwestern set and it also has this bleak black comedy aspect to it that feels feels real (laughs) feels honest and i think you and i are drawn towards those darker comedies as well i think they're like they're fun to watch in my opinion and kind of mirror life a little bit more which is i think is typically a dark comedy but this has got to be one of the only movies i know that can adequately do the minnesota accent <laughs> well probably i don't know <laughs> it's pretty good and it's one of my problems with the tv show is the accents aren't as good mm. everyone in this i think hits the nail on the head and does a great job with the accent that they're supposed to have i think william h macy does a great job of being some scared not very impressive or like self-confident individual with how he portrays it and then adding on that accent really makes him feel (laughs) smaller than he is um i think the casting is just absolutely fantastic for this movie and i would have watched a sequel movie to be (laughs) honest um i really want to spin off of francis mcdormand and her husband (laughs) because i love them so much as a couple yeah it is interesting obviously we opened the episode talking about tv shows we've now watched uh the first half of the first season Mm -hmm. of fargo uh which you're talking specifically about martin freeman's accent there so bad and in the work and and it is not great um it does not compare to this just going back to the history of the tv show so actually in the 90s they were gonna do uh there was a pilot that was shot and filmed uh, 1997, the year after this movie was released, starring Edie Falco, mm. playing the role that um, <clears throat> Frances McDormand plays in this movie, oh, okay. so playing Marge, um, and it was going to be set shortly after events of this film, just kind of like a follow-up as her as a police officer in Brainerd. Um, huh. It was directed by Kathy Bates, 
Um, and the Coen brothers were not involved (laughs) whatsoever. Uh, pilot was not picked up, did not get turned into a TV show. I think it ended up like airing on some like show that was like forgotten pilots, blah, 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 a couple years later. Um, but then it wasn't until 2014 that the Coen brothers came in and as executive producers helped, you know, push the Fargo television show to FX. Um, and then it became kind of an anthology TV show first season. I do think set, you know, in uh, in Minnesota, kind of replaying similarly. A different it, story. Yeah. The events of uh, the first movie. But they all just have a very similar tone. That's what connects them. It's that tone and it's that kind of that taste for violence. Yeah. I think that's probably why I, I think the show is good. And I think it probably helps that the Coen brothers were involved with that to make it mm-hmm. so it still feels cohesive and well done. Uh, I just think they could have cast someone better. Yeah, Martin Freeman doesn't work. Apparently, Which, he's also not a good guy either. I've learned which recently. you keep saying, and I ha- you have not filled <laughs> me also in. Also, do as some to googling why. there about why he's a guy. Uh, it's a lot, too much to get into. Um, apparently, we haven't you know spoiler alert, but apparently there is the buried ransom money at the end of this movie does appear as a subplot in the uh fargo television series so there's a little bit of connecting tissue there who buries that again is it the guy that i always think is reese whatever his name is ifans the peter other? stormare yeah yes. they look exactly the same to me <laughs> not not bushimi it's stormare he buries it and then uh you know is gonna return but obviously doesn't get the chance uh at the end of the movie no he gets caught by margie do you think he would have been able to find no. the money regardless? Yeah, probably not burying it in the snow. Because he does like make it distinct. There's something that he sticks out, if I remember correctly. But if just driving down the road, you're not, see- you're not seeing that. Nah, no shot. You talked about the casting. Mm-hmm. I wanted to hit on Frances McDormand again. She is incredible in this. I found a, a quote from Anthony Lane of The New Yorker. I uh, said, seven months pregnant, polite to a fault, smart yet slow, is only a breath away from caricature. Yet McDormand unearths a surprising decency there. And in the process, she pretty well rescues the film. And I really think it takes a while to get to her. Her and uh, John Carroll Lynch, who plays her husband. Like, it's, I want to say, 20, 30 minutes into the movie before we first see them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the beginning kind of struggles. But then once she she uh, enters the plot, like, I'm fully in. And even when she's, like, off having this weird meeting with an old high school friend like it still works for me (laughs) yeah any scene with her in it typically works pretty well for me i think she always saves whatever she's in i mean her line when she first shows up to the crime scene and says i'm not sure i agree with your detective work here (laughs) instantly you're like i love this woman like this is so good and what a what a polite way of telling her (laughs) lower ranking officer no, not even close. <laughs> like that, it just, that felt so true to Midwest, especially, and also like being a woman, like you have to find a way to not fully insult them, but also get them to go further than what they just said. And mm-hmm. I think that was really well done. I think she's a good detective. I will say again, going back to the meeting thing where it's like, that's the thing that spurns her into being like, oh yeah, people can lie and I got to go reinvestigate, go uh, go check out William H. Macy again because maybe he wasn't you know, telling the truth. I, I just think it's a weird plot detail. I get it's like kind of, it's supposed to be there as comedic relief kind of, but it's just strange. I think it's also like that plays into the caric- caricature part of like that Midwest nice kind of, you believe people are better than they are. Right. And so I think- that's that's where that if it hadn't been played by Prince McDormand, I think that quote comes really true there. Like that could have been a place that makes the movie die a little bit mm. of like that's like everyone lies. And it does feel very Midwestern and like the, you know, the guy obsessed with the, the, yeah. the girl he was in love with in <laughs> high school or whatever. Another thing, this this movie kind of plays into that. I, something I wrote down when I was watching it is like no one can hear you scream in the suburbs sort of like, mm. you know, at, while you're out here, you know, in simple Minnesota. Obviously, it's called Fargo after Fargo, North Dakota, but it doesn't really play it. It's not the setting of the movie is Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Um, you're in Minnesota and it's like you have that idea of like, on one hand, nothing bad could ever happen here. Like nothing, no violence will ever touch this community. No it's crazy nice killers. Town, right. Like safe. Brainerd, like nothing would ever happen. Like that's why, you know, the detective or, you know, the person she's saying, you know, I don't trust your detective work because he's just assuming that it's, you know, oh, you know a crash, whatever, you know, who knows, that it isn't something worse. Um, And then on the same time, it's like, 
you can have when this violence does happen, nobody notices and everybody just goes on about their daily life. And it kind of just like gets like it just happens. Right. And mm-hmm. everybody else uh, can kind of, you know, move on, except for, you know, William H. Macy, who's I'm, the whole time. Yeah. And I think that's typically where things get caught. There's always mm. one person that's antsy and nervous and can't play the part correctly. But that whole like you could get away with something. The wood chipper scene really gives me that. Like, mm. if Frances McDormand ha- character hadn't just like figured sh- this out and was on her way to kind of figure it out, he would have gotten away with wood chipping his partner in crime. Poor Steve Buscemi didn't even stand a chance, but and and nothing would have happened. Like that's kind of the genius of using a wood chipper. Mm-hmm. Like it, eventually, that's just stuff's gonna go away, and then, so it just feels like everything is kind of perfect timing. Oh yeah, in a lot of ways, which it, that's a movie. It's so luck. I mean, it's I mean, what it is, but it's what it takes sometimes to catch. This, sometimes it is luck. You know, I'm a major true crime person. I listen to like six different podcasts that talk about them, but this I think was really interesting because I think it captures a lot of the way these crimes are found. Like this could have gone and just become a huge cold case for decades, and then. Or whatever, but the, the luck happened and it worked out. But also, a lot of the true crime podcasts I've listened to have the whole like hiring someone to kidnap a family member <laughs> or murder a family member, or whatever. It never works out. No. Why do people keep trying to do this? It's it's funny you say the true crime because the last thing I wanted to mention was the fact that this movie opens with you know a title card saying you know this is based on real mm-hmm. events like the names of the people have been changed but otherwise like this really happened in 1990 or 19 whatever and then the tv show uses that same trope you know these are real events from 2006 minnesota um but it's not it's all made up like that's just that is a part of the movie that's part of the storytelling that they're trying to capture and they it's funny that this movie came out in 1996 because it's almost ahead of the time of that like true crime wave of like making movies about things and like again creating entertainment that's uh capitalizing off of tragedy which i think is a really cool aspect that they kind of just like added in there on top of it absolutely yeah like because all of this well this is made up i feel like you can find several different cases where this is this stuff happened in Mm -hmm. and so yeah and i think they're like there was ideas it's all real things that could happen it doesn't feel out there Mm -hmm. where some shows do make it seem like it's a lot more out there why would that ever happen yeah and that's what kind of almost makes it uh scarier but it still remains rather funny it's so funny and it helps that it's minnesota accents they make everything funnier (laughs) the uh the bleakness uh is is swept up by the you betchas (laughs) oh margie does it make a good date movie you think I think so. I think you can learn valuable lessons one way or another. <laughs> uh, and you can maybe start to think, oh, is would my boyfriend ever hire somebody to kidnap me for a ransom? I feel safe in that. Regard. Start side-eyeing people. I appreciate that you don't think I do that, but uh, I definitely have some considerations and things to, to think about. <laughs> Luckily, neither of our parents are, are, are rich enough to try to extort. So. For real. <laughs> Well, this has been uh, MK300, and we'll see you Mulan Rouging in the next one. Bye. Thanks for listening to the episode. You can follow the rest of our happenings over here at Cody and Corbin Have a Podcast on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Cat Podcasts, K-H-A-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. Please follow us on Spotify, give us a rating, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow along for more.